Welcome back to Brewbound's ongoing coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic's effect on the craft beer industry. I'm Jess Infante, Brewbound reporter, coming to you today from my home in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, where unlike the last video, it's actually a pretty nice sunny day here. So that's a win. Um, can't go outside, but you know. Um, our guest today is uh, Brian Kolbaki, the founder and owner of and brewer and does almost everything for <laughs> Depart <laughs> Departed Souls Brewing in uh, Jersey City, New Jersey. Hey, Brian. Hey, Jess. How's it going? Pretty good. How are you? I'm tired. Very, very tired. I would absolutely believe it. <laughs> so, um, Brian, can you paint us a little picture of what Departed Souls' business is like? So before the novel coronavirus shut down on-premise consumption everywhere in the country, um, how did Departed Souls' volume break down in terms of what you were selling into distribution, what you're selling at the tap room? Um, and anything that you sell outside the tap room, how does that break down between on-premise and off-premise? Yeah, so we're, uh, we have a very unique business model here. Uh, we are approaching five years of distribution. Um, June 16th will be uh, five years of us distributing beer. Um, and we opened as the only brewery really in the tri-state area that was brewing both uh, traditional beers as well as gluten-free beers in um, dedicated gluten-free tanks. Um, so we had a very unique business model from the very beginning, and that necessitated us having a fairly heavy distribution, heavy business model. Um, as the years have gone on, uh, and Jersey City has sort of, um, you know, sort of blown up around us. Uh, you know, they're building, I think, five different 40-plus story high rises in uh, a block radius of us right now. Um, it's changed, and the tap room has definitely grown. In fact, uh, last fall we hired our first full-time tasting room manager. Um, so our business has always changed and our distribution has always changed. Uh, generally speaking, though, we've been about 50% uh, on-premise consumption, 50% distribution. Um, and then in terms of our distribution outside of the brewery, it sort of varies throughout uh, seasonality, uh, I guess you could say. Um, we're pretty can-heavy. Uh, so I would say about... Um, probably between 60 and 75% of our outside distribution and packaged goods uh, with the rest being draft uh, consumption. Cool. That's a pretty even split. So, I mean, how, how are you right now? Like what's, what's the, the vibe been like? Well, it's uh, I think the best way to describe it is every day is it's pretty much a roller coaster at this point. Um, as soon as, you know, this really, got full bore around here. We're situated in Hudson County, Jersey City. I mean, if you walk outside uh, our brewery door, you look to the left, you're staring at One World Trade. If you're looking straight ahead, um, you're looking at uh, the Statue of Liberty. So when you consider New York City was essentially the epicenter of the first outbreak in the U.S., and then um, Bergen County, New Jersey, was was pretty much right on its heels. Uh, we're, we're right there in the middle of it, so a lot of the people that live and work around us are, are in the city on a daily basis or their families are, are in Bergen County and stuff like that. So it's been, been really unique. And then as soon as they shut down all the, the bars and restaurants, um, immediately there goes a huge chunk of our distribution. All of our, our off-premise draft consumption is just, just gone. Um, same thing when you shut down our tasting room, all of a sudden, um, you know, about 50 to 60% of our on-premise uh, business is just, just out the door. Um, and as this thing has evolved and as it's gotten more serious and, and people are coming to grips with how serious it is, even uh, the outside businesses that we're still distributing to are, are evolving and changing on a daily basis. A lot of them, a lot of liquor stores here in New Jersey now uh, are only doing curbside pickup. And so they can't have, you know, two aisles or 10 doors of craft beer and only have a case or two of this because they, they can't update their menu on a daily basis or an hourly basis, depending on their volume. So um, I, I've said a couple times now, I estimate somewhere around uh, somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of our business is just gone. Oh, my God. That's got to be nerve wracking for you, I'm sure. It's, it's definitely tough. Like I said, we and you kind of alluded to it in your intro when we opened. I, I wear all the hats. I, I kind of pride myself on wearing all the hats and. Uh, finally, last year, I decided to share some of the hats. I haven't fully taken them off because I'm an egomaniac, but 
Um, I, I finally, we have a, we have a really good team here and some of these guys, whether they're volunteers or whatever, have been with me two, three, uh, years, uh, Brant, my tasting room manager has been with me since the very beginning, um, since before the very beginning, uh, who's like my first bartender in Jersey city 10 years ago when I came here. But, um, you know, we have a really good team now and, and I don't want to do anything to upset that team. Um, and so I, I said to them at the house that, that no matter what, I'm going to do everything I can to keep this team together, um, to make sure that their paychecks are what they expect, make sure that uh, they can provide for their families, for their kids. Um, you know, I, I say to everyone when I hire them that, uh, you know, I'm going to expect them to work harder. I'm going to expect them to put in more hours, but the rewards are going to be there. And, and I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily call it a reward right now, but all these guys still get to come to work. They're still doing what they love. Um, you know, they still get to bring beer home and don't have to wait in the lines at the liquor stores. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a roller coaster, you know, it's adapt. Pivot is the word of the day every day. Pivot is definitely the word of the day every day. Um, so I know, you know, when all of this really had started, you and I touched base and, and I just, you know, asked you how things were going and how has this been affecting your team? And you really just illustrated for all of us how important it is to you to keep the team together, which is awesome. So what kind of difficult business decisions have you had to make? Were there any furloughs or layoffs? Have you had to cut back on production? We've uh, maintained everybody. Everyone is still here. Um, right. Sort of my, I guess the, the best, um, the best thing that sort of happened is that it's letting us explore unique ways uh, of operating that maybe in the past I was hesitant to uh, for whatever reason. Um, you know, my, my sales guy traveled a pretty good distance to get to the brewery. Um, so he's gotten to spend some time at home and he's, he's really working from home so that he can um, stay safe. His wife is a teacher. Uh, and I want to make sure that, that they're staying safe. So, you know, it's certainly hurt us in the regard that we, you know, we can't go out and see accounts like we'd like to, we can't go drop off samples like we'd like to, um, you know, so that's been difficult. Um, our tasting room bar staff uh, has always been um, part-time. Mm -hmm. um, so to sort of mitigate any exposure of that, we only have uh, one or two of them coming in. Uh, the rest all know their jobs are still here. What we're doing is uh, for any in-home deliveries we're, we're um, doing, we're charging a $5 delivery fee. And, you know, we still welcome everybody to give a gratuity. Um, since my uh, since my my production team, since everybody actually that worked here is revenue sharing, that five dollar uh, delivery fee is all getting pooled in between all of them, so that they still maintain some semblance of a real income uh, in terms of that regard. And then any gratuities are getting split between all of our bar staff, even the ones that aren't here. Um, so I'm trying my best to to still provide for everybody. Uh, you know, my end, it means going without a paycheck for for hopefully only a couple months. But, um, you know, I think when you start a business, you realize that you're not always going to get a paycheck. So that's, uh, that's something I signed up for six years ago. So I'm okay with that. And um, France, our tasting room manager, is here every day working his butt off. We're fulfilling orders. Everyone's wearing new hats, whether it's uh, a brewer doing in-home deliveries, a sales guy helping out on the can line. We're just uh, pitching in wherever we can. Wow, very much an all hands situation. So speak absolutely, yeah. No, everyone's been here as much as they can and, and still putting in their hours. That's that's great. I mean, it's definitely the time to do that. So, speaking of home delivery, I know you were an early adopter of home delivery, and there was a little bit of drama in New Jersey where, for a little bit of time, <laughs> the governor had told you guys to stop. And I, what, what was what was going through your head when that happened? Were you freaked out, like, oh my god, this is the like one of my few sources of income right now, what do we do? Or did you just kind of take it in stride? Yeah, I think there's a, I think there, there's either a joke or it's true. I have never really looked into it that, um, that Harvard teaches a class called like Jersey politics. Or something <laughs> like that. Uh, and I think that that about sums up what, what goes on here on a daily basis with, uh, with the alcohol laws. Um, when they first announced home deliveries, actually, I was opposed to it. I, I said right away on the, I think I was the first person to comment on our, our Brewers Association page, like, yeah, I'm not doing that. That's stupid. I'm not going to risk everybody's health. And I think 
six hours later, I was doing my first home delivery. So I was, uh, <laughs> I was pretty, a pretty quick hypocrite, but we, we, it wasn't so much us. It was, uh, it was people that lived around here reaching out to mm-hmm. us, particularly our gluten-free clientele, mm-hmm. um, asking, uh, if we're going to do it, if we're going to offer it, how we're going to do it. And, uh, you know, we, we just very quickly realized that if I wanted to fulfill my promise to the team to keep them all here, um, it was my obligation to do whatever I had to do and whatever the team was comfortable doing um, to keep afloat. Uh, you know, and I, I think that kind of goes for any business owner right now. You, you have a lot of obligations, not just to your personal beliefs, but um, to the community, to your employees, to the people you're interacting with on a daily basis. And uh, you kind of got to paint a bigger picture. It's not just about you anymore. So um, you just, as long as the people are comfortable with it and they support it and you're doing it in the right way, then, then we roll with it. And so we're pumping it out as best we can. As long as people are asking for it, we'll be there for them. So what was it like to set up home delivery? Did you have to set up an online portal? Do you plan out routes? What, what's the back end look like? So we have decided to stick strictly with our county in terms of uh, our deliveries. Okay. Uh, we had no online store whatsoever at the beginning of this. I was very fortunate to have a friend uh, that was building a new website for us that uh, was able to very quickly build us an online store into it. And we launched it without reading much of the terms and services that uh, this web provider had. <laughs> and uh, they very quickly... Uh, shut us down and withheld uh, about seven thousand dollars from us because it turned out that they uh, they did not allow selling of gift cards or alcohol on their website. Oh, um, they considered uh, yeah they they considered gift cards uh, a money services business and uh, we had to get a lawyer involved, which again cost us some more money. And uh, but oh, we did wow. eventually get all that straightened out. Um, you know, we audibled real quick to a different website that let us do some online alcohol sales, but. It became really difficult to manage uh, the walk-in clientele, the people that were still like going out for walks with their dogs, their kids, popping ahead in the brewery to, to grab beer to go uh, with the online orders, with the phone call orders, with our little bit of um, wholesale that we're still doing. Um, so it became really difficult, and we basically decided to scrap online sales completely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, we had to adapt our packaging model to this whole situation, uh, whereas before we would can, you know, a certain percentage of every batch and keg a certain percentage uh, became getting really creative and finding ways to get more beer into package goods to go as opposed to kegs. Right. Um, and so we, we just kind of had to, uh, again, pivot again on that. And um, we did a couple releases of new beers since this started, and we've done online pre-sales to sort of expedite the process of people coming in, being able to just give us a name or call when their car's outside and we can run them out for year, um, which is definitely helped. And basically what we've said is any new releases moving forward while we're under this, we'll do online pre-sales and we'll, we'll try and find ways to um, encourage people to do that, whether it's, uh, you know, save a dollar or, mm-hmm. you know, get a pint glass if you do it um, to expedite the process, to minimize the contact, to, uh, you know, to, to keep the social distancing going as best we can. But, um, for us, for the most part, we're just doing phone calls and walk-ins. Uh, we do two delivery runs typically a day, one time like mid, mid-morning, uh, and one time at the very end of the day. For the most part, people are really understanding of it. We've had a couple people get a little antsy when they don't get their beer right away. But, um, you know, for the most part, people are, are super supportive. They're, they're super understanding. They've been incredibly generous uh, in terms of both the size of their orders and uh, the gratuities that they're sharing with the team. So, um, so far a month into it, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, it's been good. And, and it's frankly, it's been a little morally rewarding to us to, to see the support, the field, the support and the love. So we definitely really appreciate it, whether we were making money off of it or not, just to know that people want us and uh, are supporting us. Uh, it gives us the warm and fuzzies. Good. Cause we all need warm and fuzzies right now. We do. Absolutely. <laughs> So speaking of new releases, uh, what, what does your innovation pipeline look like now? Like, what do you do? Are you planning, are you still innovating or are you just giving the people what they want, what they know? We're definitely, um, changing up a lot of what we had planned for this time of year. Um, So typically when you're looking at, uh, for our brewery, at least when you're looking between March and say August, 
you capture the busiest month of our tasting room followed by the busiest month of our distribution. Um, and we have certain obligations and certain beers that we're producing mm -hmm. during that time. Um, that has been completely thrown out the door at this point. Um, you know, they, uh, like a beer we are going to make for a summer beer garden, obviously we're, we're not putting that out right now. Right. Things that we thought we needed for Memorial day. We're just not even thinking about at this point. Um, you know, it's, it's upsetting, but it, it is what it is. And you just kind of got to uh, approach it with as much positivity as you can and much, as much flexibility as you can. So in terms of stuff coming in the pipeline or, or down the pipeline, we've moved toward doing lower ABV stuff, more sessionable stuff. Um, that way, the people that are buying a six-pack at home, you know, they're not buying a six-pack of eight or 10 uh, percent beers they're getting four or five percent beers um stuff that they can enjoy at home enjoy a couple more of that home without having to break their own bank uh with the understanding that uh, everybody else's income has been affected by this too even if you are still working from home chances are you're, you're not uh, bringing home the bacon the way you used to um so we want to be conscientious of that and our pricing as much as we can um but also factoring into that production cost and stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, obviously a, a triple dry hop, double IPA costs a ton of money on our end to produce. And, you know, we're, we're not necessarily getting the income that we once were to afford those hops or those grain bills, like yeast. Um, and so we, we have to factor that in as well. So the pipelines definitely changed. We're, we're trying to keep, uh, obviously we got to keep our hazy IPAs available. Um, but we're, uh, we're definitely messing around with a lot more loggers, um, which we always love to have in house anyway. Um, we're still innovating on the gluten free end. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're still innovating on the sour end. It's just a matter of um, doing things that we're a lot more comfortable with because, you know, we can't sell samples anymore. People can't go to a bar and find a beer that they like. They can't come to the tasting room and get a flight. So, uh, we have to be a lot more, uh, a little less, I guess, uh, risky or experimental, play it a little safer, but you know, give stuff, uh, put stuff out along the lines that people are used to and trust us for. Well, that makes a ton of sense. So what's the general mood like in Jersey City and Hoboken? Are people really adhering to social distancing? Do you see a lot of masks on people when you're out and about? I'd say for the most part, people are really adhering to it. People seem to be keeping their distance. Everyone has signs six feet apart, yeah, um, gloves, masks. You don't really see any big gatherings of people anywhere. I'd say at the beginning here or there, you might see some people hanging out on the street, but um, it's definitely more difficult on the days that are beautiful outside, that are sunny and warm. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we're all very lucky, frankly, that the spring has been really cold. Um, I think if we were all getting 70, 80, 90 degree days already, uh, it would be a lot more difficult to social distance right now. But um you know, this, this weather is definitely helping. Um, people are definitely staying inside. People are definitely um, ordering delivery, uh, mm -hmm. ordering quick pickup. Um, you know, if, if I left my house, which is about two miles away in Jersey City, uh, after 7.45 in the morning to get to the brewery during a normal weekday, it would take me 30 to 45 minutes with, with traffic and the schools I pass and all that. And right now I can make it in, I don't know, four or five minutes. It's great. So I, uh, you know, it's, it's great for a bad reason, but, right, uh, right. you know, the, the, street, the streets are empty. The city's taking advantage of it and paving lots of the streets. So that's great. They're adding bike lanes. Uh, so it's, as people are definitely very much taking it seriously. So um, that's, that's very good to see. And I think I read yesterday, yesterday was the fourth or fifth day where the amount of um, patients admitted into New Jersey hospitals uh, for COVID-19 decrease for the fourth or fifth day in a row. So I think people are taking it seriously and it is working. Good, good. That's really good to hear. I know up here, I think we're in mass about to hit our peak, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. And we, we don't leave. And you're absolutely right. Like if the weather had been any nicer, this would be a lot harder. Not that it's, it's not that, it's not that hard. We, we stay home, we cook food, we drink beer. It's not the end of the world. So, Speaking of, we hope. <laughs> we hope, yeah. Um, I know we covered a little bit um, what you've done with the team to keep everybody safe. 
How is that working logistically? Do you have like, you know, A team beats your, you know, team one, team two, and they trade off? Are they in the, the space together? How are you guys working the social distancing angle inside the brewery? So basically, um, when we can, people are just not here. I used to find the most cool. ridiculous things for these guys to do to make sure they were getting their 40 hours in a week. Um, whether it was washing the windows five times a day or whatever, but never said I was an easy guy to work for. <laughs> um, you know, it's basically whenever they don't have to be here, they're getting the heck out of here. Mm -hmm. I, I think anybody in the brewing industry, I mean, we are, we have to be insanely sanitary uh, in any sort of food production facility or any kitchen. So um, being clean and, and being steadfast about your personal uh cleanliness has always been something that we've we've had to be anal about um it's much more so when we leave the walls of the brewery that we have to be careful about it right um or when we're interacting with customers we have to be very careful about it uh we have a distillery here in town Corgi distillery and they're very uh generous and gave us uh some hand sanitizer that smells like gin it's very Ooh. botanical i really i think it's made my hands softer which is nice um but yeah, we, uh, you know, my mom made some masks for everybody, the Ninja Turtle themed masks. I don't oh. know if you can see in the camera that my fermenters are named after the Ninja Turtles. So, oh, uh, I get it. We, we have, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So we, uh, we have masks, gloves. I mean, anytime you touch anything, anytime a customer comes in before the next customer uh, can come in, we wipe every single surface down. Yeah. Um, we try to avoid anybody touching the cans in the cooler. We try and pick everything out for them. Um, in terms of brewing operations, it's uh, again, it's, it's me doing most of the brew days, but um, having as few people in here as possible, staggering them, um, you know, and, and really trusting the employees that when the team, when they go home, that, that they're doing the right thing and going home, um, yeah. minimizing contact and stuff like that. So, um, you know, and, and trusting that they're, Knowing that I have promised them their jobs, that, that they're not um, going to get charged for six days if they're not feeling well, um, that, you know, no matter what happens, there's a place for them here. I think having that rapport with the team uh, lets them feel more comfortable saying, hey, I don't feel good today. I don't feel comfortable coming in today or, you know, I need some time off to deal with this or that. Um, you know, I think that that's helped a lot, too. Good. That's, I mean, that's great. So have you applied for any of uh, like PPP money or I'm sorry, we should spell that out. Any paycheck protection <laughs> program money. I feel like I cover it every day, but have you, uh, any, well, like, I think I've applied for every single grant and loan possible and we have gotten none of them so far. <gasps> uh, oh. You know, I know they say they're still like reviewing everything. Right. Money might come back or whatever, but um, you know, so far, nothing. Uh, and it is what it is. It's um, sitting here complaining about it isn't going to isn't going to pay my bills. So uh, the best solution is to just get back on the brew house or get back online and, and figure out another way to get money coming in rather than than sitting here and being sad about it. It's a great attitude to have. And you are a far stronger person than I. So speaking <laughs> of getting another brew day in yesterday, you you had a brew day and you brewed a gluten free version of Altogether, which is the fundraiser beer uh, brainchild of other half. So what's your plan? Uh, Why do you, I mean, I know you guys specialize in gluten-free and that's certainly rare. I'd written a story about gluten-free breweries in the fall and there's like fewer than 20 in the whole country. So the fact that you can do it is huge. So um, how did it go? And what's your plan to promote the beer? It was a miserable brew day. It sucked. We were here for like 13 hours. Oh, God. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's fun. Um, no, so we uh, we heard about other uh, we heard about other half uh, project uh, altogether, basically through a bunch of other breweries doing it. Um, but obviously, other half I think by the by the way the crow flies is four miles from our door. Um, and when we first opened, I was way too big for my britches, and I reached out to to Sam at other half, and I reached out to different distributors all over the world. And, uh, other breweries because I was like, ah, everyone's going to want to do a gluten-free collaboration with me. And I had reached out to all these guys five years ago and, you know, fell flat on my face every time. But um, when I, when I heard about all together uh, was, was fairly quickly when it started, but before it became a, a big public phenomenon, I think I saw today there's 622 breweries signed up 
for it now. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's huge and it's still growing for sure. I mean, I, I think they even had to change how their website was to, to capture everybody on there. Um, so I read about it and, and I didn't want to step on the toes of the breweries that were invited to participate or the ones that had already joined on to the program. Um, so that was sort of phase one to figure out if there was a way to do it where it wasn't saturating the concept. Um, and that's sort of how we landed on doing a gluten-free version of it. Uh, I, I have talked to other half in the past about, about gluten-free beers and, um, I know that there are some folks there that are gluten free and, and that have loved ones that are gluten free and, and I sort of how I approached it in a, a email Sam and I was like, Hey man, like this is what I would do if I was gonna do it. Are you cool with that? Because this is a open source recipe uh to benefit the hospitality workers. Um every brewery that's involved is working off of uh other half brewers' recipes, their hops, their grains, the yeast suggestions that they're giving us and um uh, for me to do that gluten-free would mean like I'm doing absolutely nothing that they told us to do other than I could use the house. Uh, and to do that, I didn't want to insult them, upset them. I didn't want it to, um, you know, slap their name or their concept on something and, and step on anybody's toes. And uh, Sam wrote back to my email. He's like, hell yeah, you got to do gluten-free. Like we need a gluten-free. So that's how we got involved with it. Um, we've done a couple other programs to try and help the community out here. We're running a, a program called Hops for Heroes, where people can come in and buy a growler fill that we're then going and giving to the first responders uh, or the people at the hospitals when they're getting off the shift. Um, so we're trying to do as much as, as we can. And uh, you know, I reached out to Grouse Malt House, who is our uh, our maltster for gluten free grains. Uh, Twyla is awesome out there, and you know she loved the idea and she was willing to help us out a little bit uh, in terms of recipe formulation and. Um, had some new contacts at new yeast labs working on different um, yeasts that are gluten-free. And, and that's one of the ingredients a lot of people don't ever think about when brewing a gluten-free beer is that you also got to make sure your yeast is certified gluten-free. Um, and we had some contacts there from, you know, previous CBCs and stuff like that, that like, Hey, I need something that's like real juicy, real New Englandy. I know you don't have that out right now, but what do you have in the work? And so we were able to pull a couple strings that way and, uh, we brewed this beer up yesterday, and uh, we mashed in sometime around 5.30 in the morning, and I think we left here around 6.30 at night. Oh, God. Um, just to try and do everything the way that we do with our traditional gluten-containing um, hazy IPAs and bring that over into the gluten-free world. It, it's a much slower process. It's a much more delicate process. Um, the grains are much more finely milled. Uh, and so to get sort of the yield that you need into the boil kettle, and then to make sure that that all translates into the fermenter and, and doing such a massive dry hop that that's required with a beer like this, um, you know, just to do it all in the way that it makes sense and that you're going to be able to give back to the hospitality workers that the way that we want to, to the level that we want to, um, just it was, it was, a, it was a long day, but it's, it's going to be a damn good beer. And we're really excited about it. Good. I mean, that that's quite a long day though. So I'm, <laughs> Where are you doing? <laughs> you are used to it. That is true. I'm used to it. The guys were a little upset, probably. <laughs> so they're posting pictures of my dog on Instagram by the end of the day. So they, they, they had to get over it. I think they're over it. So I know that <laughs> um, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut really kind of formed a, a pact in the beginning and, and were one of the first places to ban on-premise consumption. But to help make up for that, they started, they allowed bars and restaurants to sell beer and wine, and in some cases, spirits to go. Have you noticed any of your on-premise accounts selling your, like your beer and cans to go with their takeout orders? Is that, does that help or is that just like a nice to have? We've definitely noticed bars and restaurants doing it. It's, cool. it's awesome. We appreciate greatly whenever they are doing that, that they want to include us in that. Cause obviously there's, you know, a hundred plus breweries in New Jersey and and obviously a lot of distributors throughout here that, that can offer them um, great options. Uh, they can support local a million different ways. Mm -hmm. And if they want to include us in that, you know, that's awesome. Um, you know, there's a, a bar, Cloverleaf Tavern in, in Caldwell that's continually rated like a top uh, uh, beer bar in New Jersey. And, you know, they brought a bunch of our beer in last week. Um, there's a bunch of bars and restaurants here in Jersey City that are offering takeout, um, offering growler fills. 
offering cans to go. Uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to shout them out in here, but um, you know, we have a great bar right next door called Hudson Hall that, that's filling growlers of our beer. Um, O'Leary's Public House, which is owned by a local firefighter, um, is, is even named a, a sandwich after us last week. They made a, a Jersey style fat sandwich and named it after us. And uh, oh, yeah, it was great. Oh, and, what, uh, wait, what's on it? The fat that we had uh, chicken fingers, mozzarella sticks, french fries, and marinara sauce nice. on the sandwich. And for a couple bucks more, you got a can of our beer with it. Uh, that was awesome. Um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of other bars in town, too. And, and even through our, our website, like I mentioned before, we were selling gift cards to all these places, um, even if they didn't carry our beer. So we were that, just trying to help That's such out. a great idea. Um, it was, it, I think that a lot of bars and restaurants, especially around here, um, you know, we have a bar in town called Pet Shop that um, it's, it's an awesome dive bar. It's owned by a bunch of industry people. It started only a couple of years ago. And, you know, a place like that doesn't need a website. You know, I don't think they really sold gift cards ahead of time before mm-hmm. this. So, you know, if, if we could help them out, you know, they, they've bought kegs for me in the past. Um, you know, is it, is it what pays my bills? Probably not. But they, they're people, you know, they're, they're, they're part of our community. And at the end of the day, craft beer is community if your neighborhood can't get behind you uh, and you can't you're not willing to get back, uh, get your communities back. Um, you know, what's even the point of doing it? Just stay a home brewer at that point. So, uh, you know, we were honored that they would let us do it really. And, and the fact that I think for that one shop, we, uh, we raised around $4,500 in gift cards for that one place. So wow. whether that was their rent or, or payroll or whatever it may have been, um, was great and and you know to see places again um corkscrew in jersey city heights is, is slinging a ton of local beer they're supporting us i see ghost hawk i see bolero snort um you know they're they're all pushing local as much as they can and, and whether you're a bar restaurant um brewery whatever you are however you can support each other um i think i hope that's what comes out of this is that when this is all over and when everything's all sunshine and rainbows again, um, everyone still has each other's back. Uh, you know, whether it's carrying local, buying local. Um, you know, breweries are are famous for. Uh, we don't really believe in being competitive. You know, we can call a brewery down the street and be like, "Hey, I'm out of hops." You know, <laughs> we you know that's always been something we're known for. Yeah. Um, I think I've rated Twin Elephant uh, Growler stack like two or three times since it all started so um you know it's something the brewing industry has always been known for hopefully that's something that um sort of spreads between all the industries after this is is this sense of community and this sense of supporting local that's present now you know we saw this in this area after hurricane sandy but hopefully um hopefully this time it sticks and it's it's a long-term uh outcome uh, of all of this for sure yeah, God, that's all so well said. Great points. Um, do you feel like you have the time that you want to be creative? I don't have any time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I thought you were going to uh, say. Yeah, no. They, uh, I think one of the guys laughed at me before when he heard me say uh, I was tired when you asked because he said tired at the same time. Uh, <laughs> it was like one of those jinx moments. Um, no, I mean, I, I again, part of, I guess, again it goes back to what you asked before about how we're, we're trying to, to keep everybody safe and healthy is mm-hmm. that i i'm here seven days a week i i'm the one doing the home deliveries as much as humanly possible to avoid my staff interacting with people on the outside world that have made the conscientious decision to stay home mm-hmm. um you know i don't know what their reasoning is for that other than that's what they're supposed to be doing um, but if they're not feeling well or they're more susceptible to something you know i don't want to risk these guys getting sick and um, you know, uh, worst case scenario, I get sick. Uh, I can, you know, put a TV in the brewery and yell at them remotely, uh, <laughs> but I, I'd rather have, I'd rather have three or four able bodies in the brewery than, than, than my body. So, um, you know, we we're here seven days a week We're we're here early in the morning. We're here till late at night. And, um, you know, uh, I think we always, we still drink a lot of beer. So there's, there's the creative juices are still flowing. Good. Good to hear. Not everything's dormant. Do you feel like you're in survival mode or are you? Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. We're surviving. Yeah, I think you driving. have to be. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And 
I think you're really just starting to see the effects on the brewing industry now because the liquor industry works on net 30 terms. And so for this last month where we were adapting to or accepting the reality of um, fewer sales uh, while getting a little bit of a boon from mm -hmm. the initial support local, people coming in the brewery, people getting um, home delivery. Um, you know, the state of New Jersey just, just said that uh, uh, restaurants and bars that are closed or operating on a reduced schedule um, don't have to pay their bills going all the way back to the middle of February. So we have a lot of beer that we produced and that we sold um, or that was being brewed already um, that we had to pay our bills on, that we had to pay our hop bills, our yeast bills, our grain bills, our utility bills, our rent, um, you know, uh, mortgage, our credit card bills, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. That all still had to get paid. And just now we're going to start seeing the financial effect of the reduced sales and those bars and restaurants not paying their bills. So um, for the first month, you can you can sort of adapt and say, all right, we can deal with this. But now when you say, all right, my, my distribution was reduced by 80% last month, that means starting now, I am going to have 80% less income moving forward to pay those bills. And so I think right now is, is really when you're going to start to see the hard hitting effects of this on the industry. What, I mean, what would help you right now? Like, what can you, like, can, the, is there anything the government can do that would provide immediate aid? Is that the answer? Is there something else that, that we can do? Like, what would, what would improve your life right this minute? <laughs> I know if you're I could transport tell me <laughs> my brewery to like a tropical island where this <laughs> disease did not exist, that would be fantastic. Um, no, you know, honestly, it's, uh, the, the breweries that are going to adapt, the businesses that are going to adapt, you know, we, we got to be smart about what we're brewing, about how we're packaging it. We have to look at stuff a little more analytically in terms mm -hmm. of finances than I think a lot of brewers are accustomed to doing. Yeah. Um, you know, we need, um, we need the the community support to maintain the way it has been for the last month is going to be crucial. Um, you know, I think you see more and more breweries expanding, whether they're home deliveries or states allowing breweries to ship beer or uh, distributors to come in or expand. Um, you know, I, I think if everyone just kind of can focus on their own backyard yep. um, right now, I, I think that'll help because um, the one thing we don't need right now is, um, breweries cannibalizing each other yeah. um, for their own benefit. Like we should all, we all need to work together. We all need to understand that this is hitting all of us hard and let's not, um, let's not do something that's going to hurt one of our sisters or brothers in the industry right now. Uh, so that brewery A, our brewery A survives while brewery B, you know, maybe takes away some of their sales. I think that's really important. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and ask the government, for a, for a bailout or anything like that. You know, that's, that's not it. You just got to operate your business smart and lean and, and hope that this thing doesn't last long. And um, that's really what it comes down to. Hopefully, you know, a, a lot of the, the, the beer ingredient suppliers are offering help. I think I saw um, one of the hop suppliers is offering a grant now. Cool. Uh, and I don't remember which one it was, so I don't want to misspeak. Uh it was one of the ones that begin with an H, though. Um, I know Country Mall Group is offering extended terms, uh, which has been really awesome to us. Uh, Grouse, which I mentioned earlier, um, definitely helped us out a little bit in terms of uh, pricing on things. Um, so, again, I, I think it's just about focusing on, on staying local, supporting local, supporting your local brewery. Uh, we all have great light lagers, great hazy IPAs. We all have... You know, it might not be the, the thing you're used to, to waiting five hours in line for, but um, if you want a, a brewery to still be here in your neighborhood when this is all over, um, just just go buy a four-pack for them this time. Uh, you might have to wait in a line, but the line is only because people are social distancing. <laughs> That's a perfect place to leave it. Um, Brian, I know you're super busy, so I really appreciate all your time today. <laughs>